Hello, my beautiful sisters, to all of you guys at the campuses and everybody online. I am so excited that you are joining us today. Maybe you're at home, you're on your couch, maybe you are listening from your cubicle at work, or maybe you're at a coffee shop. I wish I could see your face right now. I wish I could be across from you at the tables, but we will settle for this. It's okay. But have you guys been loving the study of Joshua? I have personally been loving it. There is so much truth. It is so rich and so full. So tonight, um, well, first of all, when Pastor Kristen actually asked me to speak and she told me that the title of the series was going to be made for this, I said, say no more. I am in. I'm all fired up already. Just the title. So let's get going. My name is Chrissy Mayer and my husband is Hal. We have been married for 14 years. Have to give a shout out to all the ladies at the Temple Terrace campus. Woo! Um, we also are serving over there. He's the campus pastor, but we also lead the young adults here at Grace through a ministry called The Exchange. Um, the chapter we are specifically going to be looking at today is Joshua chapter 19. And I must say at first glance, it seems like maybe one of those chapters that you would quickly just kind of skip over. Um, and if you did and that was you, no worries. We are going to get through this together, so don't worry about it. I got you covered. But in this chapter, we are reading about all of the land allotments that are being given out to the remaining seven of the 12 tribes. And it kind of reminded me this chapter of those other chapters that you find in the Bible, you know, that have like the long list of family lineages where it says so-and-so begot so-and-so and so-and-so -so begot so-and-so. And we're just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, but I just want you to know there is definitely something to catch here. We read here that each territory was actually outlined by specific cities which beheld smaller villages and towns and that these land allotments or these portions of the promised land ended up being named by the tribe leader who was a son and a descendant of Jacob. But one by one, God specifically commands each tribe to conquer and possess and maintain the portion of their inheritance. But in this chapter, I want us to specifically focus on the tribe of Dan. <laughs> so tonight we're going to be talking about Dan. Dan was one of the last tribes to receive their inheritance. And just after the bordering cities were established, just after the territory lines were drawn and things were really starting to get tough and they were really starting to have to fight, we pick up here in verses 47 through 48. When the territory of the people of Dan was lost to them, the people of Dan went up and they fought against Leshem. And after capturing it and striking it with the sword, they took possession of it and settled in it, calling Leshem Dan, the name of Dan, their ancestor. This is the inheritance of the tribe of Dan according to their clans, cities, and villages. Okay, now for you to truly understand what is going on here, and if you are visual like me, the first thing I thought of is, Who's Dan? What's Dan? Where's Dan? I need to see what's going on here. So I brought you visual people a map to really understand because when I saw the map and what was happening, I was honestly pretty tickled. I thought it was hilarious. So here's Dan, right? Dan the man. But here the tribe of Dan was supposed to actually take over the southwest portion of Ephraim here. But when the battle got tough and they started to struggle, they said, nah. And they headed over and they squeezed all the way up the River Jordan. They stayed here, stayed here, and they said, okay, this is peaceful, this is quiet, this is safe, and that is where they set up the city Dan. So you can see we have two entirely different locations going on here. None of the other territories had this. So I thought it was hilarious and obviously worth digging into a little deeper. So does anybody remember the days of MapQuest? <laughs> and maybe you do, because if you were like me and you were in the car on your way to who knows wherever, and you realized 15 minutes into your drive that you actually laughed, left your instructions on the printer, right? Or maybe you were one of those really cool people that had like the OG Garmin GPSs. You know what I'm talking about. The huge ones that were like little mini laptops you had to attach to your windshield. And you had to update the software very often, especially if you 
lived in Central Florida or South Florida, lived anywhere close to 95 or I-4 because you would just get lost. Um, the GPS would have no idea where you were going or what was going on. So you're with me. But for the tribe of Dan, this was not a GPS problem. If it were a GPS problem, you would constantly hear, you know, recalculating, <laughs> recalculating, right? You can take a U-turn here. You can take a U-turn here. If we were their friends, we would be like, hey, Dan, wait, stop, go back. But the distance that they went in order to circumvent their inheritance, in order to bypass their pain point, their struggle, would have been the same distance, just to give you some context, if you were to go to the most know, western point of Clearwater um, on the beach in the shoreline, and you were to go all the way over to Brandon and then stop in Brandon and say, nope, you know what, like, I don't think that this is God's plan. I'm going to take matters into my own hands because I know what's best. And then you just shot up kind of northeast and you ended up in Daytona. We're talking about a big miss to circumvent the pain and the struggle that they were experiencing to take on their inheritance. But each tribe was commanded by God to go in and possess the land that was their inheritance. So what this tells us is that while our inheritance does come with a blessing, it requires action and effort on our part. While our inheritance comes with a blessing, it also requires effort and action on our part. See, before the land was even divided, before the inheritance were even received, God knew it was going to get hard. He knew it was going to be a struggle and that there would be a fight. So he commanded them already in Joshua chapter 1 verse 9, be strong and courageous for the Lord your God is going to be with you wherever you go. So even when the tribe of Dan had all the authority of heaven behind them, right? Behind them, beside them, God was already going before them. They chose easy. They chose safe over faith. They chose their own way, right? Instead, they put their faith in their control and they settled. And God allowed it. Do you know that God will actually allow us to settle with good enough, with what we feel is good enough? So my question for you today is what do you do? What do you do when the going gets tough? Why do we as Christians struggle for settling for anything less than God's best? Why do some of us feel like we are in a constant battle to possess the fullness of our inheritance? I believe it is because we have lost sight of our identity. When it comes to fighting for freedom, for your freedom, and for the bondage that has held your family captive, and it, it seeks to, to creep in and claim the lives of the generations after you and your family, when it comes to the fight, the fight for victory over the overwhelming circumstances that are in front of you right now, hello, 2020, when it comes to the fight for you to receive the gifts that God wants you to be able to receive and the gifts that he's already gifted you but you haven't been able to fully possess yet, how easily we lose sight of who we are and whose we are how easily we forget our birthright, that we are heirs, that we have sonship, that we are daughters of the almighty king of kings. Instead, we choose to settle for crumbs and we choose to live as orphans. The root of the Hebrew word for orphan actually means lonely or outside of the protection and covering of Choosing to live as orphan refers to a spiritual condition in which we profess outwardly to know God as Father, but then we experience an internal disconnect, a contradiction to that belief. It's when our professed theology doesn't match our practical theology. 
It's when you know a lot about God in your head, but your heart struggles to truly believe in his promises that he is good, that he loves you, and that he has plans for your life and that he is going to do what he says he is going to do. We live with an orphan mindset. The orphan mindset can look a lot like this. One, it can look like competition and performance. This is found in our constant striving, in our hustle to obtain and keep improving ourselves, and we become easily threatened by other people's strengths. But when we choose to live out our identity as daughters, we are able to possess the fullness of our inheritance because we know it is our Father who has already given us affirmation and that He calls us chosen, He calls us worthy, and He says that we are appointed and anointed and that He has a plan and a purpose for our life. And the second way that we walk in an orphan mindset is we live a life of independence and isolation. We have this, this feeling or sense that no matter where we go, that we just don't fit and we just don't belong. We withdraw physically and emotionally. We avoid any interdependence on anyone. We got this, right? And always we need to feel like we're in control so we cope in different ways. But when we choose to live as daughters, we know we have acceptance, that we belong to him, that dad says, this one is mine. And the third way that we walk with an orphan mindset is we live in total fear and insecurity. We have this constant mode of self-protection that we're operating in and that we're territory, territorial of our power and our position and that we need constant reassurance because of our grave mistrust of the motives of others. But when we live as daughters, we know that we've been given access. We've been given access to all that he is and his spirit in us enables us to find freedom and confidence and peace and strength and it is freely given. He gladly gives these gifts. In the Bible, in Romans 8 verse 15, he tells us, for we have not received a spirit of slavery and bondage. These propensities, these mindsets are a form of bondage in our lives that lead us to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters. The spirit in us produces this sonship by which when we're going through it, when the struggle is real, when times get hard, we are able to joyfully cry out saying, Dad, help us. I believe that the spiritual condition of the tribe of Dan is reflected in their struggle to possess all that was promised to them. Dan continued down their own self-destructive path, doing things their way and what they thought was best, that their choices eventually cut them off from God's protection and blessing. And you can see that later that this, was, this tribe was scattered and we don't even hear about them after the book of Judges and they were not even mentioned with the list of tribes in the book of Revelation. Yikes, right? So I think the tribe of Dan has a warning for us here in the text that when we choose to live as orphans, we can forfeit, bypass, squander and flat out deny our inheritance as daughters. So our family has fostered about 16 kids in the last four and a half years. And when you go into training and they're, they're telling you about kids that come from hard places, especially kids coming from a background of abuse or neglect, um, they tend to also come with some issues regarding food. Um, they can either hoard or gorge themselves to the point where they throw up or they will hide or sneak food. And some kids just have an unsureness and an insecurity about even being in the kitchen or even at family mealtimes altogether. So at training, they tell you that when a kid comes into your house, to just go before them, to get on one knee, to look them in the eyes, or maybe scoop them up in your arms and say, you are loved, you belong, you are safe, you can trust me. And one day when I found wrappers and apple cores from one of our boys in his room, I immediately went and got him, and I took him and I said his name, and I said, I love you. Everything that I have here is yours. You have access to all of it. You don't have to hide 
you don't have to sneak. And I brought him by the hand and I brought him in the kitchen and I opened up the doors to the pantry and I opened up the doors to the fridge and I said, all of it is yours. All of it is yours. All you have to do is ask. And his eyes were big. All you have to do is ask and I will freely give it to you. I believe a lot of times that we approach God like this as well. As that fearful, doubtful child insecure about our place and our value, fearful to hope out of fear of rejection or abandonment. That's why it's easier to take matters into our own hands, right? Some of us, we've been doing this for so long that we don't even realize that we're doing it anymore because we've been living in a constant state of survival mode, always having to meet our own needs. I got this. And some of us, we've been okay with this chaos in this constant survival. Because when it comes to God, we don't truly believe that he is good and that he is a dad who wants to give good gifts to his children. We dare not ask for much. We tiptoe around him in our prayers because we don't know just how good he is and how loved that we are. Or maybe we just hold on so tightly to our crumbs out of fear that we might possibly miss out and we would settle for less. But see, when you choose to live out of your identity as a daughter, you will be able to persevere and fight for freedom. You will be able to fight for victory and fully possess all that is in your inheritance and the good gifts that lay on the other side of all the circumstances that you can see in front of you right now today because you know that his plan ultimately holds purpose and it holds promise. So when the going gets tough, sisters, fight. Turn to the girl next to you and say, keep going, fight, because you don't have to settle for crumbs when you've been called to feast.